Next bill we have is 1202, uh, Representative Becker Finn on farm survey day requirements. <clears throat> Representative Becker Finn, welcome to the committee. Uh, since you are not on the committee, I will move that House File 1202 be recommended to be re referred to the Judici Judiciary, <coughs> Finance, and Civil Law Committee. Uh, I see that you have uh, an amendment, so we'll start with uh, your amendment and then uh, you can do the bill presentation. So we have the A8 amendment. I move the A8 amendment. Representative Becker Finn, tell us about your amendment. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Happy to, to be here in your <coughs> committee uh, talking about what we can do about chronic wasting disease today. Um, the A8 amendment uh, deletes section five. Uh, I know there was some consternation about uh, that section and um, we decided it would make the bill better if we took that section out. Um, so we're deleting that section. And then there's a line about uh, the DNR potentially uh, Contracting with the Board of Animal Health, after speaking with the Board of Animal Health, they asked that I uh, remove that line because that's just not a thing that they do. Um, so removing that line at their request as well. All right. Uh, discussion to the A8 amendment? Seeing none. All those in favor of the motion saying, say aye. 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 Opposed say no. The ayes have it and the motion prevails. The amendment A8 is adopted to the bill as amended. Representative Becker Friend, please tell us about your bill. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Vang. Uh, as many of you, but not all of you know, um, we've been trying to do more about chronic wasting disease for a very long time. Um, the idea with this bill is that um, we can kind of take a more comprehensive approach and do everything in, in one bill instead of moving various different bills in, in lots of different places. And so this is um, bringing together some ideas that have come forward over the last, at least the whole time I've been in office since uh, this is year seven, I've been working on this issue. I did not run for office uh, to be the CWD person, but um, here we are. And so this pulls together um, area, you know, that's why we have several stops with this bill. It pulls together several different things. Um, to go through really quickly, um, Section one uh, has to do with premises location data, so the public is where, aware of where these facilities are. Um, section two has to do with when there is a, um, a running at large prohibited, so when you've got a, a deer or cervidae who escapes and a hunter, and we have known incidents where this has happened where a hunter has then shot the deer because a white-tailed deer looks like a white-tailed deer, and we've had hunters who fully licensed, doing everything they're supposed to be doing, who have accidentally, um, you know, unknowingly shot a deer and then realized when they go up to the animal that, oh my God, there's an ear tag. Um, and so, and in the past, we've had some issues around uh, then the, the farm owner of that deer then wanting the deer back, even though it was legally taken um, by the hunter. So that this addresses uh, some of those issues, I understand Representative Nelson has an amendment that we'll get to that I'm, I'm supportive of uh, on that issue. Uh, section three has to do with fencing. I was listening earlier. I know you talked about fencing earlier, but um, so there's a couple different things in here that require different fencing requirements. Uh, again, we took out section five, which was the ear tagging section. Um, section six uh, is uh, essentially the, the moratorium on new licenses for these kinds of operations. Um, and then we've got some movement uh, restrictions and changes in here uh, in the next section. And then we also added in section eight is a liability section. Um, you know, we've got some scenarios, for example, uh, with the, the farm owner up north who dumped uh, CWD carcasses on public land and we as taxpayers had to pay uh, for everything afterwards to take care of that. So we're putting in uh, some liability sections. That's why you're sending it uh, to my committee and judiciary uh, next. Um, Section nine has to do with uh, importing, uh, bringing, importing and uh, bringing in different uh, deer or cervidae as well as semen. Um, section 10 is on uh, federal funds that may come in and how that can be used. And then section 11 is consultation required. So essentially just 
telling the Board of Animal Health and the DNR that they, they should be working with the U of M and the good research they're doing there um, as they're making decisions. Section 12 is a notice requirement. So if there uh, is farm surveyed that tests positive for CWD, you would have to immediately notify the local uh, governments, including tribal governments. Uh, section 13 has to do with testing of animals. And section 14 is transferring um, specifically white-tailed deer to the authority of the DNR. It, we're, have tried uh, joint uh, authority and it just isn't working. It's really difficult to have two different entities who are um, trying to make decisions. Uh, so we're moving that into the DNR's uh, wheelhouse. And then uh, section 15 uh, is some funding for the U of M uh, to continue to do their research, uh, which we are seeing really great things uh, with what they've been able to learn even just in the last couple of years. So that is the bill. I know uh, that's a lot. Um, I did want to, I, you know, I know we're a little behind where we were supposed to be on the schedule, but I'll just say uh, there are more than half a million deer hunters in our state. Uh, I am one of them. Many of you are, uh, to my knowledge, I know some of you are, um, and every single one of us has deer hunters who live in their district. So this is not just a rural issue, not just an urban issue, not just a suburban issue. This, There are deer hunters who live in every single county of the state. Uh, many of those families who are deer hunters, their families consume the venison. And that, uh, that is really uh, an important part of this. For me, deer hunting is integral to who we are uh, as Minnesotans. Our tradition is of deer hunting is really strong and folks may not know uh, on the Ag Committee, but we actually have uh, in our Minnesota state constitution, we have a constitutional right to hunt and fish in our state. So um, hunting and fishing and the taking of game and fish are a valued part of our heritage and shall be forever preserved for the people it shall be managed by law and regulation for the public good. So that's in our state constitution and that really is where I am grounded in this work um, as well as uh, for folks who were lucky enough to get some of the testimony uh, and the environment committee from Chair Dupi from the Fond du Lac uh, Nation. You know, we as Anishinaabe people, this is our way of life. Um, the way that we uh, interact with our natural world and the way that we have access to uh, being able to use venison and and um, eat, you know, that I always t tell people my primary source of protein for my family is venison. And so the idea that deer who are infected with CWD because of the things we're not taking care of as a state would not be safe for my family to eat, um, that's, that's really uh, the biggest fear as we are doing this work for future generations and making sure that we're protecting those things. So I know we're in the Ag Committee, but I think that the overlap there where we've got the same species on both sides of the fence and a disease that can easily be transmitted back and forth, um, that's really where we're at. So um, I was always taught to take care of the animals and they will take care of us. And so that is really what grounds me in this work. And um, I don't know if you wanna take up some, most of the amendments, um, I think are helpful and happy to continue discussion to make the bill better. We have a couple of amendments. So we'll start with the A4. Uh, Representative Nelson, uh, would you please move your amendment? Yes, I will. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I will move the A4 amendment. And it, uh, um, as uh, Representative Becker Finn had uh, stated, uh, you know, if a hunter were to, to harvest a, an escaped um, deer, cervidae, that it would, uh, you know, there, there's several steps that they have to do, and one of them is testing. But, um, you know, if you're, and I probably most areas already have, uh, you know, may, some areas I know already require testing, uh, maybe on the opening weekend of deer, just surveillance. But um, if you don't know what to do, um, you know, you've harvested deer and um, find out it has a tag in it, well, what do you do? Well, this, uh, this gives a little bit of direction. It would just, uh, um, that they would immediately not notify the Commissioner of Natural Resources. I think part of it, there needs to be probably an investigation going on. Why is this deer out of the fence? Um, and then I think also of just, uh, I think there's also a potential of reducing conflict between a hunter and the, uh, the animal owner. Uh, you know, if the hunter contacts the owner, uh, you could have an immediate conflict and escalate things where they don't need to be. So I've spoken to the chair and I believe uh, uh, it's a, an agreeable amendment, and I, I thank you for that, and uh, I would uh, encourage its adoption. Representative Becker-Finn. 
Uh, yep, that, that's accurate. We had a good conversation, and I support the amendment. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed say no. <coughs> the ayes have it, and the A4 amendment is adopted or prevails. Is adopted. Uh, we have the A5 amendment, which was posted. Representative Nelson, I believe I'm, you want to withdraw it. I'm going to withdraw that. It was similar language, but I think we've got it clarified between the author and also the commissioner of, of the DNR. So thank you. All right. The A5 amendment is withdrawn. Uh, the next amendment we have is the A6. Representative Burkle, if you thank could you, please Madam move Chair. the amendment. I will move the A6 amendment. Um, and I did have a conversation with Representative Becker Finn on the floor just a little bit about this um, possible voluntary uh, white-tailed deer buyout program. It was it was actually proposed last year. It was a, it was a bill that Representative Heisman offered or, or dropped, actually. It never got heard. But um, we've had a lot of discussion about the dangers of CWD and, and the danger it is to our hunters. You mentioned 500,000 hunters in the state. Um, I know the letter that was submitted in your packet, and we haven't referred to it yet, but if you have it, um, take a look. Uh, we got the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association um, referencing a buyout as well and in support of it. Um, I'd, I'd like to think that if we're going to do the right thing here for, for these deer farmers who are kind of caught in the middle of this thing um, and for our deer hunters that we look seriously at a volunteer buyout program. So that's really the amendment. There's not much more to it. Um, appropriates $10.6 million in 24 and, and a half a million in 25. Um, and that's really the the, uh, the guts of the amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative becker -Finn. I thank you, and and uh, so I, I would oppose the amendment. I think it's it's premature at this point um, to be talking about, especially exactly what that number is. I think also the fact that this amendment is voluntary. Um, it probably means <laughs> we have no way of knowing if if the ones that are the highest risk vectors are the ones that we're buying out. So I'm. Um, you know, if we were ever to get to a point where we were talking about a buyout, I think we would want to just be done with farming white-tailed deer. They're a wild species. Um, they, you know, if we could have gone back in time, we probably never should have started farming them. Um, I will also say, I think the other problem that you'd run into is, is with valuation. Some of these uh, operations, for folks who don't know, they're uh, essentially genetically modified bucks that are given feed and <coughs> hormones and different things to make their antlers grow to kind of ridiculously, you know, sort of abnormal proportions. And um, there are people out there who will pay tens of thousands of dollars to shoot essentially these, uh, these mutant animals with abnormal racks. Um, I don't call it hunting because it isn't legally hunting. You don't actually need a license because you're killing a domesticated animal within a fence. Um, but it's... Uh, People pay a lot of money uh, for this. And so I, I think there's still a lot of questions about the valuation and, and how we would even figure that out. So would recommend a no vote on the amendment. Members, I just uh, want to encourage you all to keep your remarks concise. We do have testifiers here today that I want to make sure we give them time to testify. Uh, so Representative Burkle. I'll be quick, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, the, the number came about from, you know, we, we looked at the number of deer on, on the ground now. Uh, the USDA uh, indemnification number is up to $3,000. That's really where the number came from. Uh, as far as the voluntary part, you know, there's just a lot of hobby farmers that are caught in the middle of this thing. And, uh, you know, I, I really think if we're honest about eradicating CWD, we have to have an honest conversation about some kind of a bio program. That's all, Madam Chair. All right. I would appreciate a, a, a yes vote, and I'd like a roll call if possible, please. All right. Representative Nelson, did you have something to say? Yes, uh, Nelson. thank you. And um, you know, whether it's this amendment or something else, I, I do support a buyout. I think uh, um, you know many of the farms had gotten into this. Maybe they were a uh, you know family farm, and they they transitioned into this is an opportunity they had to make money at the point. And and unfortunately, through no many of them, no fault of their own, this has become <laughs> an issue. And uh, unfortunately, they maybe painted themselves in a corner, and I think we, um, uh, what you know, whether it's this amendment or something else, I think the buyout is something that we need to be looking at uh, for the public good. I think of what do we do with the property once, if it is CWD infected. I think that there's a long-term cost to the public 
Um, what if the bank is owning these properties forever? I think that, I think it becomes an issue, and um, whether it's this one or another time, I think we do need to be having a serious discussion on this. So, thank you. All right. All those in favor of the motions? No. All those a roll call being requested? Yeah. All right. Uh, we'll start with roll call. Matthew Salser. Chair Vang? No. Representative Purcell? No. Representative Anderson? Anderson, I. Representative Cha? No. Representative Frederick? No. Representative Hansen? No. Representative Reem? No. Representative Santormura? No. Representative Tabke? No. Representative Burkle? Burkle, I. Representative Carter? I. Representative Jacob? Aye. Representative Nelson? Aye. There being eight no's and five yes, the nays, the nays have it and the motion does not prevail. Uh, we have the A7 amendment. Uh, Representative Burkle, I believe that's your amendment again. Please move your amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'll move the A7 amendment. Really, simply, uh, if, if you go to section... Is it four of the bill on fencing? I forgot. Yeah. No, sorry. Yeah, I just, just want clarification. Really, the, the amendment really clarifies on, on, on the double fencing that that uh, producers would have the opportunity to use the uh, Agri Livestock and Program to uh, put those fences up. Um, and really, that's, that's it for the bill. I'll, I'll be short. Um, but... They are eligible for that under the program now. I just want clarification that they, that they could be uh, eligible still. Representative uh, becker -Finn. Thank you. Uh, we didn't talk about this one, but I'm, I'm supportive. I, I think it's a reasonable uh, amendment. And again, happy to make the bill better. All right. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. The ayes have it, and the motion prevails. I believe that is all our amendments. Uh, we'll move on to testimony. Uh, once again, due to, unlimit uh, to limited time, uh, uh, we'll please keep your remarks under a minute. Uh, the first one is Brad Galsman, Executive Director, Minnesota Conservation Federation. If you can identify yourself before the committee and proceed. Thank you to the chair and members of the committee. My name is Brad Gosman. I'm executive director with the Minnesota Conservation Federation. I'll edit my, uh, <laughs> my comments on the fly here, so excuse me. Um, this afternoon, I am testifying on behalf of the Minnesota Conservation Federation and members of the CWD Action Coalition. Uh, I did submit uh, a document with my testimony that lists the members of our broad coalition, uh, and I, I would encourage you to take a look at that document. Uh, the spread of CWD in Minnesota is real, and its impacts are being felt by deer hunters across the state. Mandatory testing is already a reality for many deer hunters, depending on where you hunt, especially on opening of firearms. Mm. And although it's primarily down in the southeast portion of the state, uh, areas near Bemidji, Brainerd, and Grand Rapids have also been affected by the spread. Captive cervid farming represents a primary vector for CWD to travel across our state and infect captive deer inside a fence and wild deer outside of a facility's uh, property. Excuse me. Uh, in 2021, the DNR and Board of Animal Health issued a report dealing, detailing their concurrent authority over the regulation of farmed white-tailed deer. In part, the report detailed some of what, some of what was found during joint inspection of captive cervid facilities. And the report reads, from the end of August to December 2021, DNR and Board of Animal Health Inspectors jointly inspected 50 registered Cerverday farms and identified 17 compliance infractions, including 10 farms with inadequate fencing, two farms with inadequate, inadequate redundant gating, two herd owners' failure to submit death reports within the required timeline, one herd owner's failure to submit samples for CWD testing, one farm where inspectors could not visualize official ID, and one farm with official identification missing. During the inspections, DNR staff evaluated the potential for farmed and wild deer to interact near fence lines, since this is a potential risk for the spread of CWD. The DNR found good deer cover or habitat at the fence line on 35 to 50 farms, close or direct contact potential between farmed and wild deer on 22 of the farms. Evidence included feces, rubs and scrapes, tracks, and wild deer sightings. 
in the vicinity of the fence. Mr. Gosselman, if you can finish your thought. Yep, absolutely. Uh, the report indicated that uh, the deer had the uh, ability to commingle. Uh, HF 1202 represents legislation that will create a, a stronger regulatory environment for these farms. Our coalition sees the potential, uh, the, the regulation of the industry is modernizing suburban farming in Minnesota. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, we have next Tony Kowas and Eric Simonson. Uh, Tony's from Minnesota Elk Breeders. If you can identify yourself again for the committee. And if Eric, if you could also make your way to the testifying table. Yep. Madam Chair, um, Tony Quillis again for the record representing Minnesota Elk Breeders Association. And there are a number of concerns with this bill and I will try and get to them within a minute. First one starts in section one, Madam Chair, where every other entity that reports and has to be regulated by the Board of Animal Health, including cattle and turkey, has their data private and this would make it public. And it is very concerning that that data would be public, especially for the families and children of those farmers, Madam Chair. Um, I'd like to also touch on section three where it talks about fencing. Um, we need some clarification there where it talks about physical contact and what that would actually look like. Would it be shade cloth, electric fencing? Um, we've been working with, as referenced earlier, the University of Minnesota, specifically Dr. Scott Wells on some biosecurity, uh, and no other state requires this contact, Madam Chair. And you're going to see, unfortunately for us, in the next 24 to 48 hours, why we think removing the, te the determination and reasonable time for the Board of Animal Health to repair a fence. If we get what we've got going to come down today, it's going to be hard to get in to repair a fence. We can secure the animals and make sure that they're okay, but getting a chance to repair that fence might be a tough due to natural resources. It talks about fencing and after um, being detected for chronic wasting disease, holding that fence up and not raising farm uh, on the farm for up to 10 years is going to be the change. The federal rule right now enforced by the USDA is five years, um, Madam Chair. So I just wanted to point that out. Representative Becker Finn referenced the liability section, and I agree with her that anybody that has unlawful disposals should be prosecuted. But this also includes the sale of animals. And the incubation period on elk is three years. There's a chance that you're going to be able to sale an elk and have no control over it whatsoever. So I Tony, requested you and talked thought, about please. inserting uh, language that would say at least known to be infected by. And Madam Chair, I think the artificial insemination section would help decrease movement of animals, and I think it would be tough to um, enforce and regulate. Madam Chair, thank you for the ability to comment on House File 1202. Thank you. Uh, Eric Simonson, if you can uh, identify before the committee, and please keep it concise. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is uh, Eric Simonson. I'm a lobbyist that represents the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't repeat everything that's been said, but we want to express our gratitude to Representative Becker Finn for bringing forward House File 1202. And we want to express our support of the bill as amended to members of this committee. Uh, I don't have to tell any of you about the impact CWD has had and seems to continue to have on the wild deer habitat in Minnesota, and we believe uh, very strongly, in fact, it's been a long-standing legislative priority of our association to advocate for double fencing and better enforcement on servant farms. Thank you, Representative Becker Finn, Chair Vang, members of the committee, for the opportunity to testify in support of House File 1202 as amended. Thank okay. you. Uh, we have Tim Spreck and Scott Fire from the Minnesota Deer Farmers. If you can identify yourself before the committee and proceed. Madam Chair and members, good afternoon. My name is Tim Spreck and I'm here today representing the interests of the Minnesota Deer Farmers Association. Madam Chair, I would love to have the opportunity to go through this bill line by line because there are a lot of very concerning and industry ending provisions in this Mrs. bill, Sprech, but in the interest already, of time. Members should have already read the bill, so we don't need to go through line by line, but please uh, make your remarks on, on <laughs> where you think, uh, please keep it That concise. was not my intention, Madam Chair. I would like to have the opportunity, but I'm not gonna do that today. So if any members would like to meet with me or meet with Deer Farmers, we're open at any time. 
The concern we have with 1202 is that it really brings an end to deer farming in, in four significant ways, by increasing costs, by decreasing revenue, by increasing regulations, and by phasing it out over time. Um, I do want to thank Representative Chair Becker Finn for accepting a couple of amendments that make a little less heartburn. Um, and in the spirit of cooperation, I will make myself available to her at any time she would like to have additional discussions. And at this point, I'd like to stand aside and let the folks that drove a uh, lengthy amount of time to get here today have the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Scott Fire, please identify yourself and proceed. Madam Chair, members, my name is Scott Fear. I represent uh, the Minnesota deer farming industry as, uh, as the president. And uh, on behalf of our association, I want to acknowledge how devastating uh, House Floor 1202 would be to our business. Um, it put virtually all of us out of business, um, bankruptcy. Um, you know, this is how we provide for our families. This is how we put food on our tables. This is how we put our kids through college. Um, I also want to acknowledge all the revenue that we, uh, we provide for our local businesses and our communities. Um, also wanted to point out that uh, I think there's a lot of misinformation and maybe at times even some disinformation on CWD. Um, you know, when I do, when I run the numbers on uh, the Board of Animal Health data and even the uh, DNR data, over the last seven years, we're talking about an infectious rate of less than a half a percent. Um, I agree we CWD is real, but to, is this really about CWD? Um, and there's not one person, not one group, now, one association in this entire state that wants to solve CWD worse, or more, I should say, than the Minnesota Deer Farmers Association. Um, so we'd, we would encourage um, you to work with us. Um, and also, as far as uh, feed, I guess there's a comment made about feed and hormones and uh, genetically modified animals. Um, we feed our animals just a, it's a very natural. It's a, it's, it's a lot like a calf feed. Um, there's no hormones. Um, there's no modification in President any President Scott, regard, if you can so. finish your thought, please. All right. Thank you for your time. Uh, Dr. Scott Josephson, if you can identify yourself before the committee and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair, committee members. I'm Dr. Scott Josephson. Uh, I, I own and operate Tricon Veterinary Clinic in Taunton, Minnesota. I've been in business for 38 years running a general veterinary practice, and I serve uh, reproductive uh, work for 60-plus de uh, white-tailed deer farms throughout the Midwest, uh, from here to Louisiana and Pennsylvania and back. Uh, I'm here to discuss the, um, the, the semen article in the bill that you're considering, and I'm, and I'm trying to offer a path forward and a solution to this problem. The, the Board of Animal Health has, has very uh, uh, well pre presented the resistance that we found in these white-tailed deer and uh, both the 50K genomics and in the alleles that are found to be uh, giving us resistance in these animals. I would say that the number one, when we breed these deer, the number one selection criteria that these farmers have is what are the resistance traits in those deer. So that's an important factor that these guys are using when they're trying to establish the rooting programs within their farm. Uh, the other thing that needs to be mentioned is that 70% uh, of the wild deer, up to 80% of the wild deer in Minnesota don't possess these resistant genes. They are almost exclusively the high, most highly susceptible animals res, uh, genetically to the disease. Dr. Scott, uh, if you can please finish your thought. I'll finish quickly. Um, semen semen uh, uh, that is used in these programs is from deer that are likely have been harvested. And most states require testing, CBD testing, on these deer when they're harvested or they die on the, on the deer farms. So the, the semen that we're using likely has come from an animal that has been already tested for CWD and found to be negative or it would not be used in the system. Um, there's a scrapie model that can be used. The USDA has used that very effectively in the last 20 years. Uh, scrapie, which is the same disease in sheep as in white-tailed deer, uh, has been eradicated from the United States in, 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 in 20 years. Thank you, uh, so Dr. that's Scott. a very effective program that we use, need to use for a model. I urge you to use the, the scientific approach Dr. Scott, uh, using thank genetics you so much. to achieve the goal of eradicating uh, CWD on these white-tailed deer farms. Thank you. Um, we are over committee time, but I'll hmm. allow for two questions for members if you have questions to the bill author. Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would first ask if this bill could be held over. There's a lot of a lot of questions we could ask. It's very important to the ag situation. 
Well, that'd be up to you. But my question to the bill author is the live animal test, is that recognized by USDA and would there be indemnification if an animal had to be put down uh, because of that, that two-time test? In Representative Beckerfin. I thank you and thank you for the question. Um, it, it, not a gotcha, the USDA is behind um, in getting this, this test uh, confirmed. I know I, I had a really good conversation actually with the folks at, folks at Board of Animal Health yesterday um, about things we can all be doing to um, put pressure on the feds to get uh, this test um, verified as far as they're concerned. It's, it's verified as far as many scientists believe. Um, what would happen, and, and one dis a discussion point that uh, I had with the board was about doing some kind of voluntary program. And so if I, we recognize the RT Quick is not recognized by the USDA in their indemnification program, but you could follow up that testing. So for instance, if you were positive for CWD under RT Quick, you could then do the additional testing and have the results that you would need to be indemnified. Uh, Rep. Senator Cha. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question is um, annually, how much does the uh, uh, Board of Animal Health and the DNR spend on you know, policing or managing the uh, CWD problem? Do we have somebody here to answer? Representative Becker Finn? I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. Again, there's like all these different things that are happening in different spaces um, on that front. But I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer to, to that off the top of my head. Representative Burkle. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I really just have a comment. I think I think it's just it's poor for us to be moving this bill this quickly. It's obvious we have a lot of questions. Um, Dr. Josephson had some really interesting testimony in the environment based on the alleles and genetics going forward, um, and, and just the fact that we've got farmers on the line here and their livelihoods, and we're rushing this through is it's irresponsible, and it makes me shudder to think of what we do to the rest of our ag industry if we treat it in the same way. I will just add that this is not a new bill. We've heard these bill before. I think the new language was the live testing one. And so I believe, Representative Beckerfin, you would like to add on to that too as well? Yeah, I was just going to say thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Burkle. You know, this isn't a new issue. Like I said, we've been working on this for seven years. Um, as to the genetics piece, I think the idea that we would somehow want to mess with the wild herd by somehow putting genetics that uh, I, I, I just don't think that's a, a path that we want to go through, go to um, with messing with a wild animal. Um, you know, I understand folks may have questions about that, but that's sort of, <laughs> I think that's a bad policy choice uh, for us to be messing with the genetics of wild animals. All right, uh, Representative Anderson. Ma'am, I would motion to uh, table this bill it was mentioned that uh, this bill's been around for seven years, but looking around, there's a lot of freshmen on this committee who haven't heard this bill at all. I move to uh, table the bill and ask for a roll call. A roll call being requested. A uh, motion to table. Uh, discussion to, is there a discussion? There's no discussion. Since there's no it's a tabling motion, there's no need for discussion. Uh, roll call. Matthew Saucer. Chair Bing. No. Uh, Representative Purcell. No. Representative Anderson. Anderson, aye. Representative Cha? No. Representative Federer? No. Representative Hansen? No. Representative Reem? No. Representative Sensormura? No. Representative Tabke? No. Representative Burkle? Burkle, aye. Representative Harder? Aye. Representative Jacob? No, Jacob, aye. Representative Nelson? Aye. There being eight no's and five ayes, the no's have it. The motion is not adopted. Uh, just to the bill, seeing none, I will renew my motion to recommend House File 1202 as amended to be re, to re refer to the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee. Is that Representative Beckerfin? I uh, thank you, Chair. If I could just have a closing. Uh, All right, closing comments. Please keep I'll, it short. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to say for the record, this is about CWD. There is no conspiracy as we talk about the safety of people's families and their children. Um, myself and other members of this committee have been have experienced threats because of our work about this. So I think it's important that we dispel any of that misinformation and disinformation that is happening. This is about public policy. 
Um, at the end of the day, we are legally constitutionally required to weigh the need to protect deer as a wild game species uh, above the desire to support a commercial interest. We're not out to get anybody. We're trying to do right um, by the people of our state. Uh, thank you for your support, uh, Madam Chair. All right, I renew my motion to recommend House File 1202 as amended be referred to the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed say no. No. The ayes have it. The motion prevails. House File 1202 as amended is recommended to be referred to the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee.